This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Stay tuned to find out how you can get Surfshark for 85% off and get three extra months for free. Well, the year 2000 is considered by many to be the best year the WWF had during the Attitude Era, not just in terms of financials and ratings, but also in terms of their creative output and the stars they had in the locker room at that time. So it only makes sense that this is one of my most requested pay-per-views ever to be doing on this classic segment. It's Fully Loaded 2000 from June 23rd at the Reunion Arena in the gaming hotbed of, let me check my notes... Dallas, Texas. That is important for the hype package we'll get into in a minute, but this is, like I said, a very highly requested pay-per-view, and here are the names of those who did request it. Antonio Basile, SK Goldings, Pizza Guy 22, Matthew Carner, Alexander Wynn, Marcus Mason, Michael Lee, and Nicholas Tedesco over on patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret. There's a good reason a lot of people have nominated this show. It's considered by many to be one of the most underrated shows of the Attitude Era. When you hear this show being mentioned, you Usually the word underrated goes along with it, and I probably will say that word a couple more times throughout the course of this review, but this is a very strong show for a few reasons. It provides a big breakout moment for a lot of stars. This show is known for it being a triple main event, was how they booked it, and you have these three upstarts in Kurt Angle and Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit taking on The Undertaker, Triple H, and The Rock, respectively. The three newer guys versus the three established veterans and the bigger stars, which in doing so, by putting them against each other and then also billing it as a triple main event, you've immediately elevated all three of those younger guys to make them more uh, verifiable stars. But it isn't just the triple main event that makes this show so special, it's also the very well done undercard too. Not a whole lot of stinkers on this show and uh, we'll get through it one by one, but I, I think a lot of the stuff that we see on this show really holds up. So let's get into it. Beginning with the high package where basically it tells you wrestling is a lot like a gambling addiction. Adrenaline surges through their veins, a euphoric rush. Everything is on the line. The opening packet says their fate will be determined by the roll of the dice. Uh, no, they won't. Uh, there's really, besides this opening high package, there's no real mention or theme of gambling throughout the rest of the show, except for the dice you see in the lower third name graphics. But yeah, uh, they really put all their eggs into the gambling basket in this one, and it just doesn't really play into the rest of the show here. They also say these dice are fully loaded. Again, not really an applicable term because there are there's there's loaded dice. That's a real thing, but fully loaded dice that doesn't quite apply to the metaphor of the gambling. It is a fully loaded show, so at least there's that. 16,500 people in attendance here, 420,000 pay-per-view buys, a 1.04 buy rate. It's up from 360,000 buys the previous year, which if you recall, the main event of that show was Austin versus The Undertaker, end of an era match where it was a first blood match as well, and by Austin winning it, Mr. Man be, would be gone from the Federation forever. Oh, how the times change. But that was the previous year's main event. By the way, Foy Loaded 2000 is the final Foy Loaded as of this time. I mean, they may bring that back at some point in the future, like they did with Backlash a few, several years ago, but uh, Foy Loaded only went from 1998 until 2000. And by the way, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler are on commentary here. The set confuses me during the entrances often, because we see the guys in the triple main event matches on the left and right of the main Titantrons all show long, not just for their matches. So, seeing Triple H and Chris Jericho looking angry next to Trish Stratus looking all sexy in that opening match, does send some mixed messages here. It's kind of confusing what the focus should be on. And speaking of Trish, your opening match is an intergender six-person tag team match as TNA, that's Tustin Albert and Trish Stratus, take on the Hardy Boys and Lita. So the backstory to this is Trish Stratus, of course, being the manager for TNA, doing a lot of bad things at ringside as of late. And even the hype package emphasizes Michael Cole saying, what a witch on SmackDown. Lita begins helping out the Hardy Boys at this point. She was formerly with S.A. Rios, but at this point, she's a member of Team Extreme and so she and Trish have been getting into some scraps here. And we've really run the gamut here because we've seen boot attacks, we've seen disrobing, we've seen a table spot, we've had a whipping. And those last two things I just mentioned happened in the span of one week on Go Home Week between Raw and SmackDown leading up to this. This is pretty much this whole feud here is the first real movement in the very long standing feud that Trish and Lita would have over the years. And uh, what a way to start out. As the match begins, Lita, who's still selling the impact from last week's beatings, goes for Trish right away, but 
test blocks your path. Now, uh, the four guys in the ring, the Hardy Boys and Test and Albert, have a great chemistry in the ring. I think a lot has to do with their upbringing because before they all got called up to, you know, the television product, they were all trained together under Dory Funk. So you had the Hardy Boys, you had Edge and Christian, you had Test, you had, I believe you had Val Venus in that group as well, and some others. Like, they all kind of trained and they worked together very extensively before they got called up. So for them to have this match here just shows more of that chemistry at work. Impressive rope work by Matt against Albert. Jeff tags in and the ladies go wild. Double team move on Test on the ground. Matt Fist drops nothing. Oh, the field day they would have on Twitter. Hashtag cancel the Hardys. Jeff does Jeff things early on with a cross body to the outside. Trish goes for a slap, but Matt moves and so she hits Test on accident. Lita finally tags in and the crowd wants it big time, but here comes Albert instead. The boys suplex Albert, they and Lita suplex Test and Lita. The shirts come off and the crowd is electric. Jeff is dumped face first to the outside by Test from a Gorilla Press. Gets worked over extensively here, but he gets out of the way of a diving elbow and makes the tag to Matt. Test the pump handle slam and a cover, but Jeff breaks it up with a swanton very expertly timed. Albert comes in, but Matt thwarts him. Lita's tagged in once again, hitting a tornado DDT on Test, and she dives onto Albert and a hurricane run on the boot. Hell yeah, Lita. A close near fall, Albert with a cheap shot and a gut wrench powerbomb to Lita as well. Trish tags in and tries to be capitalizing here. She goes to the pin, but Lita kicks out. Lita slaps Albert off the apron. After you can tell, he's definitely calling a spot as he leans in the ring there. Superplex by Lita onto Trish. Lita hits the moonsault on Trish and wins the match, but right afterward, Albert jumps Lita. The Hardys are taken out. Trish gets the belt out and begins to whipping Lita once again. We saw this happen on SmackDown uh, the, a few days ago. Lita screaming in pain. The Hardys chase the baddies away. I give it four stars out of five. This is a really great opening matchup for a lot of reasons. Like I mentioned, the in-ring chemistry between the four guys in the ring, seeing the tension with like Lita and Trish and the anticipation fans had for them to finally clash in the ring. And speaking of the fans, my God, the crowd was so hyped for this matchup. And we'll see some more of that kind of excitement as the show goes on, but it's a great indication of the kind of excitement and anticipation the fans are feeling throughout. So yeah, a lot of cool moments in here. Trish looks like a real piece of work for doing the whipping after the match is over. Uh, yeah, like I said, just fantastic opener. Commissioner Foley's having a chat backstage. Edge, one half of the tag team champions, approaches him and says, Christian has food poisoning and he can't compete tonight, but Foley just accuses him of having Frady Cat-itis, which of course means inflammation of the Frady Cat. Elsewhere, Undertaker comes rolling, 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 rolling into the arena. Where is that Kurt Angle? Suddenly we see Kurt just down the hall there. Taker chases Kurt through the backstage area on the motorcycle and into a small room. What an amazing visual of Taker just trapping Angle in that small room with a motorbike. Well, it's been an interesting 2000 for our friend Taz. Of course, he debuted to big fanfare at the beginning of the year in the Royal Rumble at MSG against Kurt Angle. Then he went and won the ECW Championship on one of his days off against Mike Awesome. And then uh, things started to kind of come off the, fall off the rails after that. In May, he was taken off of TV with an arm injury. Then he came back at the beginning of July and he was starting to cause all kinds of ruckus. Taz is a heel now and he's just jumping random mid-carters and everything. He cost Rikishi the Intercontinental Championship against Val Venus a couple weeks earlier from here. At one point, he beats up Sky Too Hotty mid-worm, and I love his promo after the fact he did it, going, W, O, R, O, O, I just choked your ass out! Uh, yeah, he's basically saying everyone's just another victim. He's thug life, he's thug bread. When, he's when he dies, he'll be thug dead. Big ol' heel turn for Taz here, and so he picks a fight eventually with Al Snow, who takes offense to it, and that's what leads to this next match, is Taz's first match back on television since his injury against Mr. Snow. Snow starts out strong against Taz, goes for a leap off the corner, but he lands right on Taz's shoulders and he's hit with an Alabama slam. Snow with a big old top rope leg drop and a moonsault, but Taz still kicks out at two. I swear at one point they're in the middle of a hold and we hear a boring chant and that always drives me crazy. You know, in the history of me watching these shows, I feel that every time I've heard a boring chant, it just is never justified. Like, yeah, this match might not be the same level of like intensity and like boom, boom, boom as we saw the previous matchup here, but the crowd I definitely was tired. I think they were just kind of hoping for more of the same kind of intensity. Taz chop blocks Snow and gets on the attack after taking all that offense from Al earlier. Snow makes a comeback with some strikes, but Taz catches him mid-kick, hits the catch suplex, keeps fighting for the Taz mission. Snow keeps trying to escape, but it's ultimately no use. The Taz mission, the Katahajime, as Joey Styles would say, is locked in and Snow taps out.
This one gets two stars out of five from me. I felt with a match as short as this one was, they tried their best to cram as many spots as they possibly could in the time they were allotted. In doing so, and whether or not this was intentional or unintentional, it just showed Taz to be kind of like no-selling everything Snow was hitting with, uh, which was, you know, good if you're a fan of his old ECW stuff, because that's kind of how he wrestled then, but I don't think that was going to fly with his new setting and his new environment and his new place on the card. There were some cool moments in this matchup. I really like the closing sequence that they're fighting over the Taz mission constantly. It's a good introduction for like heel Taz at this point, but I think it could have been done a little bit better if it had more time to stretch. And I guess if you think about where Taz is going to be, not even more than one month from now at SummerSlam, yeah, this might be the last, one of the last real positive moments of Taz's career as a wrestler. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Say, Big Hoss McGraw, what's got you down in the dumps? Well, hell, kid, the world's going nuts. That's what's got me down. I'm stuck inside the house all day, and now I'm hearing stories about hackers taking my private information from my phone. I didn't even know this thing had a data plan. Well, worry no more. Huh? Thanks to Surfshark VPN. The heck's a VPN? A very personal narcotic stash? I've been running low on the gimmick lately. It's kind of weighing on my mind a lot. A VPN is a virtual private network, a tool that guarantees online safety. Oh, does that mean my phone won't get hacked? That's right. Surfshark protects your internet connection from those looking to steal your information, even on a public Wi-Fi network. Well, listen, I fancy myself a bit of a hardcore gamer. Would a VPN help me out here? <laughs> Sounds a bit out of character for you, but yes. With a VPN, things like slow speeds, ISP throttling, or even doxing are things of the past. Surfshark lets you change where in the world you access the internet from, so you can even buy some games for less than you would in other countries. Well, hell, I'm sold. How do I get on board? Right now, you can get Surfshark on all your devices. Support this channel by going to the link in the description and use the code REGRET to get Surfshark for 85% off plus an extra three months for free. <laughs> all right, I'm on it. Hello? Uh, is this the Sharky gimmick? In the locker room, Christian's totally blowing chunks. This reeks of sickitude. A medic checks in on him and he just clicks the light into his eyes a couple times and goes, he can't go tonight. Oh, is that all it takes? We then cut to Triple H and Stephanie McMahon Helmsley, who are apparently watching what just transpired with Edge and Christian and Foley. They're reacting to it like they just saw it on TV, yet we see them on camera now. So who's watching them? All these flowers keep coming into the dressing room and Triple H wants to know who are they all from because they're not from him. The card reads, good luck tonight. It's true, it's true. Could it be Stephanie's good friend Kurt Angle behind this? Ooh, scandalous. European title on the lineup next as Eddie Guerrero, who's with his mamacita at China, defends against Perry Saturn with Terry. Uh, two former members of the Radicals going at it here. Uh, these guys kind of broke up one on their separate ways a few months before this and so they're clashing here. On the go-home SmackDown before this, you see Saturn taking out both Eddie and China. As the match begins, Terry, who got some slaps in there and back on SmackDown, she mocks China at ringside. China then decks Saturn and chases after her. After the brawl on the stage, the match officially begins in the ring. Eddie hits like a hip lift or something on Saturn, some incomplete back elbow. It didn't look that great, but that was a very small blemish here in the match. China clotheslining Saturn, who's a big flip on the floor. China gets involved a lot in this match here. A little more wrestling, Saturn back outside, China attacks again. Look at the rebound by Saturn, by the way, off those stairs and a dive by Eddie. Back in the ring, a power bomb by Saturn. Eddie comes back and hits a tornado DDT. He goes up to the corner, but Saturn catches him and hucks him off. Another snap power bomb. Saturn goes to the moonsault, but he misses. A brain buster by Eddie. He goes to the frog splash, but Saturn moves. Eddie corrects in midair and tries to recover, but Saturn drops him. Perry on the turnbuckle. Eddie drop kicks him out of the ring. China goes in for an attack, but Saturn stops her this time. Clotheslines her through the announce table. Like she just falls and the, the table collapses under her weight. Terry shows back up. She's used a human shield by Saturn, but she takes Eddie to Dick Kick City. Saturn with a flying elbow to the back. The referee, I think, was checking on China the whole time. Otherwise, where was he? He comes back to make the count and Saturn wins the championship. 
I give this one three and a half stars out of five. This was a very enjoyable match. And again, there's that word underrated again. Of all the matches you think about on this show, if you're familiar with it, you might not think of Guerrero and Saturn, but these two really brought it. And also China getting involved as well. I think they added a little bit extra excitement to it. And just the finish itself was also pretty wild. Whether the table was supposed to give out under China or not, who's to say? But it was just another bit of spark that added to more of just how, how wild this match was. The athleticism between Eddie and Perry, I think was great. Back in the locker room, Edge and Christian think they've gotten away with murder, avoiding the tag title match, and they say food poisoning rules. But Mick Foley walks back in, sees that Christian is not sick. Suddenly, Christian bolts back to the toilet. He's barfing. He's blowing chunks. He's 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 pouring a bunch of soup from a bucket into the toilet. I gotta love it when you get that alternate camera angle where Foley looks over the wall, the toilet, uh, the stall, and then you see from his point of view to see Christian's actually being a fibber this whole time. It's the empty arena match at halftime heat all over again. Anyway, Foley says that they are totally busted and the tag title match will be happening as scheduled. Elsewhere, Michael Cole's interviewing The Undertaker, and Taker goes, I'll tell you what my medical opinion, Kurt Angle's gonna need a doctor to surgically remove my foot from his ass. And then we see the all-knowing monitor just happens to queue up next to them. What's Kurt Angle doing? He's getting on Taker's bike. Taker chases after him. What is Angle doing? That habitual line stepper. Edge and Christian defend the Tag Team Championships against Bradshaw and Farouk. The Acolytes, not quite known as the APA just yet. Anyway, Edge and Christian have been running scared from the Acolytes ever since they became the number one contenders for the belts about a month ago. We get a pre-match promo from Edge and Christian as they are often want to do during this time period. Edge uh, mocking local sports teams in Dallas. And then Christian goes, what's the deal with the Kennedy assassination? And he goes, was it a, <laughs> a lone gunman? Was it a conspiracy? It doesn't matter because JFK would have committed suicide if he spent five more minutes in Dallas anyway. What a timely reference. How is about that presidential assassination from almost 40 years ago? Even Jim Ross had to like profusely apologize for the rest of the match saying, I'm sorry for those comments and we did not, that is not indicative of the World Wrestling Federation. He's having a backpedal for Christian here. So then, and then I love after the whole, let's just drop this hammer on the Kennedy assassination. Edge goes, for the benefit of those with flash photography, like, let's get back on that train there for a second. But then uh, the acolytes interrupt and then Bradshaw gets blown up, cutting a promo, a Texas sized promo about the wonders of Texas, the Vaughn Ericks, the Freebirds, sports. He is out of breath at this point as the match begins. It starts off as a brawl before they all get into the ring. Super fall away slam by Bradshaw onto Christian and a big ass power bomb by Bradshaw to Edge. Edge is a night breaker on Bradshaw to get the advantage for a little while. They're about to suplex him off the top, but he shoves him onto the mat. Big hot tag to Farouk, who slams and hits Busters aplenty. Edge grabs one of the title belts as Farouk hits Christian with a dominator. Count on one hand the number of times he hit that on someone in 2000. Edge comes in and just decks Farouk with the belt right in front of the referee. They get DQ'd. Oh, those nasty heels. They try to escape, but the Acolytes chase them up the ramp, and they'll fight another day. I give it two stars out of five. It was an okay match with a pretty cheap finish but it was pretty on brand for the champions at the time. Uh, I think that the match like, didn't really get a chance to go into like a next gear to really kind of ramp it up for me. I've said it before and I will say it again that Edge and Christian are my favorite favorite tag team of all time, I think, in particular because their wacky shenanigans and the funny promos they would cut. And to a 14 or a 15 year old like me at this time, I was loving it. But like, man, what is a randomly dark promo? How about that Kennedy assassination? At WWF New York and Times Square, the big boss man harasses a bar patron, even takes some of his beer. That customer right there wasn't supposed to be in the ring. Backstage, Triple H is mad about all the flowers Stephanie keeps getting. And Stephanie finally tells him, go talk to Angle about it if he's so upset. Meanwhile, Angle is still being chased by The Undertaker, but Kurt's able to outsmart him, bonks Taker in the leg with a comically giant wrench. How did Taker not hear Kurt sinking up behind him? I mean, he's got some jingly ass medals. Undertaker. Oh. Then after Kurt leaves, Taker holding his leg in pain goes, Go show ass, boy! Which I believe roughly translates to, God, it's your ass, boy. A real hidden gem on this show is a cage match for the Intercontinental Championship as Val Venus with Trish Stratus in this corner taking on the former champ Rikishi. Now, as I mentioned two weeks ago uh, on SmackDown, Taz cost Rikishi the Intercontinental title against Venus, who as of late has been taking on a real new edge. Not only does Val have the new attitude and he's got a new haircut as of this night and he's got new like rave theme music. Val Venus, Trish is back! 
Where was this edge? Where was this attitude by Venus in his feud in 99 with mankind? Considered by many to be a feud or an attempt to get him over in the main event level, but it completely fell flat in his face. If Venus had this edge in 99, I think we'd be saying a different story about him. Val's thrown on the cage walls early on. Rikishi goes to the door, but Val chop blocks him. Rikishi goes to the sting face, but Val hits a low blow. Hits a bulldog, but Rikishi gets down a little bit late for it. Kind of some miscommunication. Rikishi falls off the ropes and into the ring. Val with an elbow drop off the middle of the ropes. Nice. Venus goes to the top of the cage, but Rikishi cuts him off. The guys fight both guys. End up getting crotched on the top rope there, so a bit of a zero-sum game. Venus throwing rights, but Rikishi fires back up. Samoan drop, big splash in the corner, and a bonsai drop. Big Quiche goes to the big door, but Trish slams it in his big head. Venus with the money shot, and we get a kick out. Lita shows up with a belt and starts to whip Trish, really laying it in there. Lita chasing Trish out of the scene, so she's no longer a factor. Val's not off the cage and goes into the referee, so he's out, as if it matters because it's a cage match. Rikishi then climbs the cage, makes it to the top, he gives a knowing look, and the crowd just can read it immediately and goes nuts for what's about to happen. He slowly shimmies his way to the middle of the cage and does a giant splash onto Val. Okay, a few questions here. One, how'd the ring not break? Two, how did Rikishi not get horribly injured from that fall? Three, how did Val Venus not just die on impact or leave a giant like Val Venus shaped crater or just like flatten like, like Judge Doom and the steamroller and Roger Rabbit? Like how none of those things happen? Rikishi goes to the door, but Taz is back and he attacks with another video camera, the same way he cost Rikishi the IC title a couple of weeks ago. And before he can make his sneaky escape, he's tripped up by the camera cables. Nice work there, Taz. Venus slowly makes the cover. The referee slowly counts. Val wins and retains the gold. I give this one four stars out of five simply on the merit of that giant splash that Rikishi hit from the top of the cage. That is like, that's a Hall of Fame, it's a career-defining moment for Rikishi. It's probably one of the wildest moments in the year 2000, during which there was a lot of wild stuff, for good and for bad, across both WWF and WCW. But Rikishi doing the dive off the cage definitely, I think, belongs in that top 10. And then you see like the Trish Lita feud bleeding into this thing as well. You've got Taz being Taz, even though it's kind of a cheap finish, it's still like, oh, it's like the heartbreaker. But after all that action, how can you really be mad in the grand scheme of things? I mean, this was just, it was a really well done matchup. And I think it was one of the better ones Val Venus certainly had during this run. And Rikishi, I think this is one, again, one of his probably his more memorable matches he ever had in a singles capacity. Uh, yeah, this is just, if you watch one match on this show, if you've never watched Fully Loaded, like watch this one just to see like what happens in that splash. It's insane. Backstage, Taker symbolically wipes away the number of days since a workplace accident. Elsewhere, Triple H runs into Harvey Whippleman, who's got some flowers on route to Stephanie again. Triple H demands to know who's sending them, and he's brought to a locker room. Triple H goes in thinking it's going to be Kurt Angle, but then we hear a violent confrontation. It's Chris Jericho. He was the one who sent the flowers all along, and he got a jump on Triple H before their match later tonight. What a crafty guy. Back in the arena, Shane McMahon appears dressed to fight, and he calls out the Rock says he's the giant killer. The Rock then comes out the champion dressed like Shane McMahon, no less. What flattery. The Rock agrees to the crowd who are chanting pussy at Shane. He knows it's a setup, so where's Benoit? Is he under the ring? Is he up Shane's ass? The Rock is ready for a fight, but Chris Benoit appears on the big screen and says since he's going to strip him of the title, he might as well strip him of his GQ clothes as well. So he begins to start tearing up the Rock's $500, $600, $700 shirts in his pants, dumping motor oil on them, breaking up the sunglasses, and and so the rock runs to the back and he's got to take care of that stuff. I think it's crazy just how like, all three like the triple threat or the, the triple main event matches like they all got not just like the matches themselves but they all got like multiple segments of build in the show itself. Like TV wasn't enough for these three matches. You had to like set more things up with Chris Jericho and Triple H with Kurt Angle and The Undertaker and with The Rock and Benoit and I think it's really uh, interesting they would do that for all three of those matches. Uh, really kind of it's basically a different, it's, it's, a, it's a fancier version of what we see on those weekly programs. And what's interesting about the Angle thing is that Angle's story kind of overlaps between The Undertaker and Triple H. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole details and the minutia of the Angle, Triple H, Stephanie love triangle thing, because we're seeing the beginning of it here. And I will inevitably cover SummerSlam 2000 on this channel, so I'll get into more detail of it then. But 
but I will say that this stuff with the flowers and the good friend Stephanie McMahon and everything and Triple H's jealousy, they're all planting these seeds here. It does a really good job moving that story along too. In the first match of your triple main event, The Undertaker takes on the Olympic hero and the new king of the ring as of last month, Kurt Angle. Well, the new king has gotten on Taker's bad side fairly quickly at this point in a number of ways. First in costing him and Kane the tag titles in a match, then by celebrating one of his own victories with some food a little too close to Taker's bike. Well, that parking job's on Taker, honestly. Kurt offers up a moped as a peace offering, one of the classic Kurt looks here, but Taker's having none of it. Kurt says he's no longer afraid of Taker and he proves it by not only dumping some what looks to be steaming hot porridge on his motorcycle, but also bashing him in the leg with that cartoonishly large wrench once again. Kirk gets scared by his own opening pyro here. The Undertaker doesn't even get his official entrance. He just rides out on the bike and comes after Angle during Kurt's entrance. Fighting through the crowd and at ringside, the match finally begins in the ring. Taker's just toying with Kurt early on. He keeps pulling him up from the pinfall attempt. Angle gets some hope by getting a foot up in the corner, jumps onto Taker's back with a sleeper. Taker fights it off, but Kurt hits a sneaky wrench shot once again on the outside while the referee doesn't see. Keeps attacking the injured knee. Taker goes to the choke slam, but Angle hits the leg again and just keeps working on it over and over again until Taker eventually counters out of it. We get a comeback from Taker, a choke slam. Taker still isn't done. The last ride! The last ride! Taker wins. I give this one two and a half stars out of five. This one's kind of a tricky one to judge because of the three triple main event matches, this one is the shortest and it's probably the weakest of the three. But I would say that this one still, like, is still good for what it is. Uh, Kurt looks really good here. What's probably his biggest test since WrestleMania 2000 when he's in the triple threat with Jericho and Benoit. And so for him to go up against The Undertaker in this match, his first real serious singles matchup with a bona fide star like that, and to hold his own and still look good, I think you can't really ask for much better than that. Again, the match itself wasn't too long. It was, a, I'd say it was it was kind of a slow going uh, for the most part until Taker's comeback and everything. But yeah, I mean, Angle, I think he passed the test. He'd be champion by the end of the year, so this is a very good test for him. In your second main event of the evening, Triple H takes on Chris Jericho in a last man standing match. They say on commentary, it's actually the second last man standing match in company history. The first one being last year at St. Valentine's Day Massacre with The Rock and Mankind for the championship ending in a very disappointing draw. It's hard to believe there was a time where you can count on one hand the number of last man standing matches there were in the company at this time. So the build of this match is Jericho's been a thorn in Triple H and Stephanie's side for months. And, and, and Jericho's been really going after Stephanie here. This is the height of his whole thing where he would call Stephanie a, a bottomless or a bottom, a bottom feeding trash bag, $2 hoe and all that stuff. And a, a King of the Ring the previous month, uh, he plants a kiss on Stephanie in the middle of a match and everything. So, uh, and, and then he started to cost Triple H matches. He costs him a championship opportunity. He gets Rikishi stink faced, costs him a match against Kai and Tai and the Brooklyn Brawler in one of the more famous matches or one of the more famous moments, I guess, of early SmackDown was when Triple H was benevolent enough to lose to the brawler and Kayantai. That was a pretty big moment though. So as the hype package uh, so delicately explains, Triple H wants his ass. I want Jericho. I want his ass. I want Chris Jericho's ass. I want Jericho's ass. He and DX get Jericho's ass a week or so before the pay-per-view by beating him half to death with a sledgehammer. Then Jericho demands from Commissioner Foy that it be a last man standing match, and he says he feels like a hunter. The battle begins fast and furious. Very elaborate sign in the front row that we see when they brawl ringside. Somebody stapled a bunch of women's underwear to some poster board, and it says, Stephanie's panties, and they're marked down to the point where they're free. You just don't see creativity like that in signs anymore with the multimedia. More fighting on the outside. Triple H takes advantage, and he rips the protective tape from Jericho's injured ribs and is on the attack. Stephanie with some slaps in as well. Lots of abdominal stretching by Triple H here, but Jericho is able to fire back. Hits a great spinning heel kick. He goes for the lion salt, but it's nice to Triple H to scoot into position to get the knees up. Jericho gets back up, walks into a sleeper, and he's passed out, but he's able to get back up before the 10 count. Jericho wants some more. Triple H gives him a pedigree. Jericho defiantly gets back up to the approval of the crowd, but he's taken down with a chair. Goes from their pedigree to Triple H, but Jericho Jericho with a low blow. Now it is Jericho who has the chair. Big old dink to the head and H is bloodied. More attacks. Jericho with a face buster on the chair for good measure. Back on the outside we go. Triple H goes for a pedigree on the steps, but he takes a backdrop off them. They each grab a monitor from the announce table and they hit each other simultaneously, which is pretty hilarious. They each manage to answer
gets the count though. Pedigree attempt turned into the walls of Jericho. Triple H taps out, but it doesn't matter in this match. Stephanie finally gets in the ring and breaks it up, and now Steph is in the walls. I like how Triple H has to hit the ropes first before hitting Jericho to break the hold. No rush or anything, H, it's just your wife. Triple H gets the sledgy, swings through the fences and hits the ring post. Jericho slingshots him into said post. Jericho now grabs sledgy and attacks. Y2J looks to be going for a lion salt off the timekeeper's table, but H to low blow and a back suplex through the announce table. Triple H though looks to take most of that impact. Triple H barely answers the 10 count while Jericho stays down. Then Triple H falls down immediately after the bell rings, but it doesn't matter. He wins the match and is the last man standing. This one gets four and a half stars from me. Uh, this is a great last man standing match and it's great because of these early ones. It didn't rely on gimmicks like duct tape or a speaker box trapping someone inside another box. You know, a great story of Jericho's ribs being under attack and his big fiery comeback. Triple H being a bloody mess. Even Stephanie getting her licks in as well and getting hers with the walls of Jericho. It is probably one of my favorite matches between, between these two together in their long-standing rivalry and probably one of my favorite matches just individually from Triple H and Jericho. And even though it did break my 15-year-old heart to see uh, Jericho lose the hands of Triple H, uh, looking back, I can see this was a damn good match. In your final main event of the evening, The Rock defends the WWF Championship against the rabid Wolverine, Chris Benoit. Now, Benoit, a former IC champion in his own right, has recently aligned himself with Shane McMahon. And so he's been wreaking havoc on members of the roster. Guys like Eddie Guerrero, his former Radicals partner, like Chris Jericho, like China. He's been making things very personal with The Rock and the beatdowns he's been doing with him as well. I think that him siding with Shane McMahon at this point in the game was a really good move for Benoit because at this point, you know, he, at this point, and also forever, before and after this, never really good at promos. So he was also still relatively fresh in the company. I think he's only five months into his run in the Federation at this point. So, by the way, great for Benoit to get a title shot like this five months into his run. So anyway, him being with Shannon, I think it was a great move because it really just, it really gives him instant heat and legitimacy. And though he does talk during this time period, he doesn't do it as much. Shane does a lot of the heavy lifting between the two of them. The Rocks have beaten the hell out of Benoit in retaliation, even going so far as to hit the rock bottom on a car. Commissioner Foley steps in and makes the rule that the title can change hands in a DQ, which I feel is an odd stipulation to have for a babyface champion because it's one of those things where it's just like it's adding odds to him. But I feel that like, oh, when you the title changes hands on DQ, that's something that's supposed to like really be good for the babyface, like someone chasing a championship and like the heel champion who's been ducking and using weapons and stuff. Oh, he can't fight out of it now. So I think it's interesting they flip that and put it on a babyface this time. Benoit comes out wearing one of the Rock's tattered shirts. Shane still dressed as a Rock cosplayer. Benoit jumps Rock after a Shane distraction to start the match. Bit of a run around with Shane ending with Rock slingshotting Benoit into Shane, which is pretty entertaining. Rock goes to the cross face but Benoit escapes. Benoit on the offensive now working over the Rock, but the Rock hangs Benoit over the rope, hits what they call an XFL punt on commentary. Big back suplex off the top. Benoit decks Rock with the belt while the referee is distracted, but the Rock kicks out. More back and forth. Every time the Rock begins to build an offense. Benoit just snuffs it out. A sharpshooter by Benoit, but there's a rope break. Shane yoinks the rope down. The Rock falls out, fighting on the outside. Back in the ring, The Rock with a dragon screw and a figure four. Look at uh, the technical wizard here, The Rock with his shitty looking figure four. Man, he was not good at submissions. Shane with more cheap shots on the outside. There's fighting in the crowd. Benoit suplexing Rock over the barricade. But at this point, the Shane McMahon interference does get a little excessive. And it's funny because like the day before I'm recording this review, I had just watched Money in the Bank 2020. Like for comparison's sake, Jackson Riker was ejected for doing like nothing compared to what Shane's done in the course of this matchup. For the same rope pull down thing, that's what he got busted for. That's one of like six or seven things Shane has done in this matchup here. They're just throwing out ejections left and right today compared to how they were in 2000. Rock kicks Benoit and goes up for a power bomb, but he goes backwards and Benoit with an ugly landing on the ropes. Chris recovers though and hits the diving headbutt. Rock with the people's elbow, but Shane prevents the count from happening in a timely manner. Benoit brings a chair into the ring. The referee stops him. Shane takes out Hebner with it from behind. The Rock chasing Shane out with the chair, putting Benoit in the cross face. Hebner calls for the bell and he awards the match to Benoit. Hebner seems to think the Rock hit him with the chair because when he gets up and finally sees the Rock, he's holding 
holding the chair, just barely dropping it after Hebner is revived. And so as the Rocks trying to figure out what's going on, Shane with a big flying dink with the chair to the Rock's head. I loved Shane's diving chair shots he did around this time. So the Rock is now bleeding. Benoit is declared the new champion. We are in the darkest timeline. Then all of a sudden out comes Commissioner Mick Foley who makes a beeline past Benoit and Shane, gets on the mic and says that was not a DQ. It was not the Rock's doing there. So he is restarting the match. As the match restarts, Benoit hits the Germans, but the Rock kicks out of that. Crossface applied, there's a rope break. The Rock wills his way to a rock bottom to win the match and retain the championship. And Mick Foley looks like a proud papa. I give this one four stars out of five. This is a very dramatic main event with a lot of twists and turns. I think Benoit looked great here for his first real main event showing in this kind of capacity against The Rock, at least in the WWF for the very least. And The Rock showing his tenacity was great too. Even without the bait and switch, had, had the darkest timeline actually gone through and Benoit walked out as the champion, I would have been happy with that. I think the fans in Dallas were also open to it as well based on their reaction. A uh, funny story, not the last time Benoit will be the victim of something like this in the year 2000 because later I think Unforgiven there's a bait and switch as well where he thinks he wins the championship by cheating but oh that Commissioner Foley he reverses it yet again so uh, yeah Benoit this was kind of like a, a great for, like I said great first showing for Benoit here and the main event I think was very well done the story was great with the false finish or the, the dusty finish I guess of The Rock being l lost the championship but oh the match restarts yeah just a great dramatic story here my final grade for Fully Loaded 2000, the gambling pay-per-view, is an A-. Uh, I have been looking forward to watching this show again and doing a proper review of it for a very long time on this channel. I have a lot of fond memories of this show from when I watched it as a teenager, and so it was great to revisit uh, the matches. The show, I think, still holds up very well. Lots of great matches, a very hot crowd, and some spectacular moments throughout, not just in the main event picture, but also the undercard as well. Like I said at the top of this review, the word under is thrown around a lot when talking about Fully Loaded 2000, but after 20 years of hindsight, I think it's safe to say that this show has been properly rated in hindsight. It's a really good showing of the present and the future of the company as we head into SummerSlam. When will I review that show? Uh, not next time, but like I said, inevitably. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Fully Loaded 2000. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Next time, we are staying in the year 2000, but we are not looking at the World Wrestling Federation. We're not looking at World Championship Wrestling. We're looking at the third group of the big three during this time, ECW. On this show, a new television channel champions crowned, a legend takes it old school, and one of the most controversial moments in ECW history, if you can believe it, happens on this show. It's Living Dangerously 2000. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Well, now you come into the city that has five Super Bowl championships.